It always makes me smile when people kind of say how accomplished we all are as entrepreneurs because when you're an entrepreneur, you always remember the times when you're scared witless and, it, and it's not going well. We'll talk about some of that um, in a moment. But um, I'm so delighted to be here today um, at this conference. I've heard um, so much about it in the past and I'm really, really excited to be there. I'm also really happy that it's International Women's Day, so happy International Women's Day for those of you who are celebrating and I hope you all are. Um, and it takes a lot, I must say, to get me up at 5.45 a.m. on a Saturday morning and, um, and also to miss my beloved Arsenal who are playing um, at the Emirates at 12.45 today. So that tells you a little bit more, um, much about how passionate I am about entrepreneurship and I can assure you that there's nowhere else um, I would rather be this morning than, than talking with you, so long as my favourite player, Lucas Podolsky, scores later on. Um, now, I'm looking forward to really getting to know all of you and also hearing about some of the businesses that the people in the room are currently running, but also those of you who will be thinking about starting to build um, a venture in the future. And I've chosen to share a little bit today about what I've learned from some of the best entrepreneurs in the world that I've been lucky enough to meet, but also a little bit about my journey too and how to thrive and survive as an entrepreneur. I hope we can kind of take from the talk some topics to debate, maybe some practical advice, and potentially encourage some of you who are thinking about being entrepreneurs that, um, that you absolutely can do it. And if it's a path that you choose to go down, then I personally think that entrepreneurship is one of the most meaningful experiences and rewarding experiences um, on the planet. So I highly encourage you to, to think about it as a career. And I'm going to focus on the big picture, really, in this talk, because there's lots of really fantastic practical how-to sessions coming later on. Um, but also in the questions at the end, I'm really happy to talk about specific topics like raising finance and so on, if that's something you'd like to talk about um, in the questions later on. So before I get um, fully started, I couldn't continue without saying thanks to some of the fantastic people who got me here today. And the first is Cindy Gallup, who's at the back of the room. And um, she recommended that I take part in the debate tomorrow, and that led to me speaking here. Um, and so thank you very much, Cindy, for paying it forward to me. Um, and for those of you who don't know her, Cindy is quite honestly a force of nature. She's passionate, she's charismatic, she's generous and courageous, so you better make sure you're there for her talk this afternoon, which is changing the world through sex. And frankly, who doesn't need that? on a Saturday afternoon, so I'm definitely going to be there for that. And I'd also like to, these people, I mean, don't they look like movie stars? I kind of put them all up, and I'm like, wow, they look amazing. So here's, um, the next person is Susan McTavish-Best, and she's an Oxford alum, and um, somebody who's done an awful lot to connect entrepreneurs in Oxford with a tech elite in the US. And it's through her that I met the wonderful Kulveer and Harjit Tucker. They're amazing guys. Um, many years ago, actually, when they were still here, um, and they used to come to our Glasshouse events and were really thinking about whether they should go into safe city jobs. I think one of them had a really top offer from one of the top law firms. I think one of the, the other was, was going to look at banking. Um, and right from the get-go when I met them, it was really, really clear they were going to be uber successful um, at, at whatever they turned their hand to. And I, I really felt that the world could do with more entrepreneurs like those two. Um, and so I sp played a small part in helping them choose to carve out their own paths as entrepreneurs. And I just couldn't be happier to see how successful they've become. And um, I think Cole's speaking tomorrow, to later on today, so, so don't miss him. But I also hope that um, some people who are right here sitting in this room a few years ago have gone on to do amazing things. So I'm looking forward to seeing what some of you in the room do too. So... I'll just give you a little bit about my experience as, a, as an entrepreneur. When you, when you meet entrepreneurs, they'll all have like this kind of messy path of stuff going on. We'll come to that in a minute. But um, my grandfather was an entrepreneur, and actually he was one of the early pioneers of radar. So I was very lucky. I grew up in an entrepreneurial household. I was taught to code, age seven, on a very, very slow, tandy computer, which was state of the art at, at that time. Um, and like most of you, I was a, a straight-A student, so I was offered um, a place at Cambridge, which I probably know was um, the wrong choice if I was thinking about Oxford. But in the end, um, I decided to follow my passion. Actually, my passion was business, so I turned that place down and I went to study at Warwick University's uh, business school. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll talk about that in the debate tomorrow, maybe, those, those choices. Um, and then from there, I went to um, uh, be a consultant to Arthur Anderson, did that whole kind of fancy 
city thing. But when most of my colleagues were heading off to do their MBAs, I decided to take a different route. Um, and I went to join the management team at Pret a Manger. And from there, I went on to co found my first startup and the first dot com boom, and that was Moonfruit. And we raised, I can't remember now, something like £8 million over the course of our, our life and became top 20 website in Europe and so on and so on. And, and, and the business was sold last, uh, last year to um, Yelp, who have now become Hibu. Um, and one of the reasons I think that I chose to take that different path quite early on in my career is some of the lessons that I learned from my father. So my father was a, you know, a very successful corporate uh, executive. We had a lovely lifestyle, nice cars, house. My sister and I were lucky enough to go to private school. Um, and then towards the middle of his career, my father decided to change direction completely and follow his passion. And he became a garden designer with my mother. Now, my sister and I were slightly stuck up little teenage girls, and we weren't too happy with that downgrading in our cars and our lifestyle. Um, but two years later, I think, we learned our lesson, because two years later, my father died suddenly, and we were able to look back on those last two years of his life as probably some of the happiest and most fulfilled parts of his career. And I think that taught me that life is incredibly short for all of us, and it taught me to seize the moment and really focus on living your passion and living what's worthwhile. So I think it's thanks to my father and my grandfather that I really thought about being an entrepreneur. And a little bit later on, we'll, we'll hear from my friend Amelia, who's here, who's just started her business and, and will tell you that it's changed her life. So um, I hope really that entrepreneurship can be something that many, for many of you helps you live your lives to the full. So. Um, some of the things that I do in my life now, I focus mainly on my business, consulting business takeout. We'll talk about that a, a bit in a, in a minute. Um, and also the on, group for entrepreneurs that I run called The Glass House. But I'm also um, an investor and an advisor for um, a range of businesses. So a couple to pick out so far sound really cool. They do pop-up gigs, uh, live gigs in people's homes all over the world. And they're growing like topsy and uh, doing a brilliant job. And then on the other side, True Office are an enterprise business, again, growing brilliantly. Um, and they provide compliance training for things like banks and lawyers and so on, but in really fun, engaging uh, game ways um, on uh, iPhones and iPads and so on. And they're not, not necessarily a sexy business, but some of the sexy businesses are the ones that I find grow the fastest and, and do great. And then there's some other businesses I advise and, and um, really excited to um, just to become an advisor. And I haven't even had my first meeting that yet. Yeah, that with the Oxford Mindfulness Center and um, so excited about that. And then in terms of um, advisory boards, um, I'm lucky enough to sit on the advisory board for Tech City um, UK and that reports into Downing Street and we um, focus on how can we help the technology community in the UK to really become vibrant and, a, and an international force to be reckoned with. And then I sit on a range of, of other advisory boards, including one for a fabulous social business called um, Slanky, which helps only hires young people who've been unemployed and helps big brands understand um, how to engage with young people. So they're, they're definitely one to watch out for. So a little bit about takeout. So, um, when I founded the business, I wanted to start to think about some of the experience I'd had between big and small uh, organizations. And it struck me that actually, if you really want to drive innovation in today's world, you need a range of skills. And so we have a mixture of blue chip strategists, so people from some of the top consulting, advertising, and investment banking firms, people who've run major companies, so ex-country manager of eBay Germany, or marketing director of Skype, and so on, and award-winning entrepreneurs. And, um, we mix those with what, um, a Rolodex of um, entrepreneurs. They could be one of our entrepreneurs is, for example, the co-founder of Foursquare, a well-known journalist from uh, organizations like Wired, and then um, it leading innovation professors from schools like Harvard or, or MIT and so on. And we put all of those four skills to work um, and help big companies. We have clients like Samsung, NBC, Channel 4, and so on drive innovation in their organizations. And I think it's really important to, to remember that entrepreneurship can be done inside big companies and, in fact, inside governments too. And that's something that, we're, that we've been working um, on doing. And then at Glasshouse, oh, actually, one thing here before I forget. I knew I would forget this slide. Um, one of the things I think we think is really, really important to driving innovation, but also entrepreneurship, is the power of your network. Um, and so at Takeout, we run regular 
event. So we just get our network together to debate, share ideas, um, and we also put a fair amount of time into helping our network, and in return, our network obviously um, look after us. So this is um, a fun dinner that we did in my apartment in New York, um, and it just kind of always, whenever I see these fantastic faces around, it start to just feel a real energy from the other entrepreneurs in the room. And one of the big tips I would say when thinking about an entrepreneurial career is that you can't start to build your network um, early enough. Um, so, and then Glasshouse is a, a group that um, I and some colleagues run to drive, to support entrepreneurs and um, support and inspire them. Uh, mainly in the tech industry, and we, um, we run events in London, New York, San Francisco, and, and far beyond. Our speakers have included people like David Cart from Tumblr, Jonah Peretti from BuzzFeed, uh, Daniel from Spotify, and so on. And I'm going to really draw on some of the stories that they've told at our events, as well as some of the lessons I've learned from the entrepreneurs that we work with um, at Takeout to, um, to kind of bring some of the stories to life now. Now... One of the first things I learned after leaving Anderson's to become an entrepreneur is the things that I traditionally relied on to do well, like being smart, working super hard, all of those kind of things, just didn't cut it in an entrepreneur well. I mean, you definitely need them, but actually what I realized that entrepreneurs need more than anything is courage. Um, and I think this quote here from Astro Teller, who runs the Google X Labs, really sums it up. To, me, to be an entrepreneur... I think one of the most important things is to have this unstoppable optimism, but also be able to balance that with being completely paranoid about all the things that can and will go wrong uh, on a daily basis. Um, and as all entrepreneurs um, will tell you, the trick is often to keep things very simple and clear for your customers. So I've taken this to heart in the, the model I'm going to share today about entrepreneurship and, and the journey of being an entrepreneur. Um, and it's very simple, as you can see from my three words on the, on the screen. Um, the way you think impacts the way you act. The way you act clearly determines the end result. And so I'm going to kind of take those three angles and look at how the process and the approach which you take to being an entrepreneur um, can really make all the difference. So if we start with the initial belief, the idea for your venture, the seed... And I think for me, the first thing first is it has to be something that you're really passionate about. Um, entrepreneurship is a brutal experience, and at times it stretches you to the core. So if you're going to dedicate a big part of your life to this, it had better be something that you're absolutely passionate about. Um, and I think one of the great quotes from Jeff Bezos from Amazon said, one of the huge mistakes that people make is that they try and force an interest on themselves. And, and I think the thing is you, you, you don't choose your passions, your passions choose you. And I, I know when I was building my businesses, I spent a lot of time worrying about what was the cool thing to be doing or what was the right thing to be doing. And actually, the answer was in, forget what everyone else is doing, what is really meaningful to you, and what, what can you get really excited and passionate about. Um, and my other observation is for those people who choose to be an entrepreneur, like Cindy, to change the world and make it a better place for all of us, tend to be the ones who do a bit better. And I think one of the reasons for that is that when the chips are down, and make no mistake, they will be down several times, over and over again, until you feel like you can't take it anymore. If you're doing it in the belief that you're going to make the world a better place, or you're fixing something that needs to be fixed, or you're helping some people with a product or a service that you think is really important, that will inspire you to dig deep um, and carry on where most others... Um, wouldn't. Um, and I also think it's really important when you're starting out to, to remember that your dream and your vision is just as valid as ones that have already become successful. Um, and as one of the women of the moment would say, you know, wherever you're from, your dreams are valid. And I think almost every successful entrepreneur will tell you tales of people who laughed at them or wouldn't support them when they started out. It's happened to me many, many times over. But it's your job as an entrepreneur to believe in your passions when no one else will, and eventually they will come round. And the people who laughed at you, by the way, will be some of the first who tell you, oh, I always knew that would work. <laughs> no, no, no. But let them have their moment. Um, so let's talk about action now. Um, and it's where the rubber hits the road. And I think courage again comes back. This is where you're going to need the courage to face all the obstacles and the naysayers who will be um, in your path, the courage to risk your reputation, 
the courage to risk your cash. Um, most of us who've entrepreneurs have had experiences, and I certainly have, of the times when you know we've had millions in our business account, and there's times when we are running on fumes, and it never ever that experience, that lurch in your stomach when that time happens never goes away. And it will happen to all of you who become entrepreneurs at some point. And it will also take up most of your spare time. Um, and I think one of the most striking factors that all the most successful entrepreneurs who've come to speak at the Glass House have in common is that they've carried on through pain and challenge long after most normal, or you could say, sensible people have given up and just gone and got another job. So if I remember Mick Birch from Bebo, when he came to tell his story, and he's got a fantastic wife, Sochi, um, and, a, and a, family, a big family of kids. And as he was building Bebo, Zochi was not only running the household, looking after the kids, but was also the main breadwinner, while Mick sat in the corner of their living room, coding away on one successful or unsuccessful project after another. And there came a point, actually, where Zochi's parents suggested that she might consider leaving him because he was not going to amount to very much. And as many of you will know, that um, uh, Mick and his team sold that business for $895 million cash not long after that time. Um, and I think maybe Zochi's parents have changed their mind. We'll see. But, um, and then, you know, the, the last FM team, I mean, when they came to speak at Glasshouse, they talked about the fact that things had got so bad they were living on a tent on the concrete roof of their office because they'd run out of cash, just again before the business turned. Um, Michael Smith from Mind Candy, one of my, my great friends, you know, found himself with the possibility of not being able to make payroll at Christmas um, and tells a fantastic story of you know, going to almost meet his last chance saloon of investors in a cab, the laptop with a presentation breaks, a global crisis breaks out in the financial world, so half the investors leave the meeting. And one guy took a chance on him and covered the payroll to Christmas. And from January, they switched on the uh, freemium part of their business, and the business has been profitable ever since. Um, or B&Q, two founders to B&Q, but one of the founders left before it became really successful because the challenge and the fear of building a business and the strain of building a business was too much, and he was never sure it was going to be successful he unfortunately wasn't able to participate in the, in the later success. Or Luke Johnson, I think, is coming to speak tomorrow, um, and he spoke at one of our earliest Glasshouse events, and unlike some of the other speakers who talked about their successes, he spent the whole talk uh, talking about the times that he'd failed and failed and failed again, and every time that he'd, he'd had a disaster. And I, I remember, all these years later, I remember one quote which I use regularly, which is, I don't care who you are or how big your business is, you're never more than six weeks away from bankruptcy. And um, it stayed with me. And, um, and he gave one of the most galvanizing talks I think we've ever had at the Glass House. So I think those examples show that if, as entrepreneurs, if we're to thrive and survive and find a way to keep positive and keep our vision, we have to be able to keep that focus and that positivity when in almost kind of extraordinary circumstances. And I think building those skills is crucially important. It's actually about managing your mind. Um, and that's something I've had to learn the hard way, I think. Um, I also believe that, lovely Morrissey, look at him. Um, uh, that some of the most successful and happy entrepreneurs operate in the belief that kindness is a strength. And it's not easy to be kind and behave with integrity when you're under great pressure. But if you do, you'll be able to build a network who will see you through um, and will also help, help you to feel respect for yourself too. And it, I think it's one of the biggest tasks I put myself under as an entrepreneur is to always be kind. And I'm learning how hard that is. You know, we're naturally, you know, even when you're children, you kind of, and you start playing, you try to snatch toys from other children. We're not naturally set up to always take the kind route. But um, if you take that route, I've learned that it really pays over and over again. And, and by the way, actually, while we're on the subject, it's food for thought that a lot of businesses that seem to do better when they start to do charitable activities and acts of kindness, as well as their commercial business too. And, and when I talk about kindness being a strength, I don't think that means being weak. I mean, I, I really mean it as a strength. Um, you know, you can't be weak as an entrepreneur and let others take advantage. And I have learned several times over, and often to my great financial, and we're talking a lot of money, and emotional cost, 
um, it really pays to be astute and to keep your eyes and ears open. And also not to undersell yourself just because your company isn't well known yet. Um, I think many of us will tell stories where we've lost a lot of money and had some quite emotional experiences by not having been really astute. There'll be plenty of people who'll suggest deals and arrangements who aren't in your best interest. They'll be very seductive. You'll think they know better than you. They don't. Um, and really, really do keep your eyes open and, and make sure you talk to others who've been there before you for advice. And if I had my time again, I wish that I'd uh, surrounded myself with even more good advisors and I'd, and I'd also gone through every single scrap of detail on the key points, even when I was exhausted and all I wanted to do was go to bed. And I've learnt that the hard way. Um, and actually, if you keep that in mind, the entrepreneurial community is really open and supportive and they will share ideas and tools and processes. So, you know, use them. They will help you. And there's almost like a jungle drums of entrepreneurship I've found where other entrepreneurs will let you in on this. Don't go near that person or that one's the right one to go to. Or they'll keep, you know, they won't talk about it publicly, but if you get in on the jungle drums, you'll be able to find the, the, the right ways. Um, and I think, make no mistake, this kind of building phase of entrepreneurship is, is mentally and physically exhausting. If you've seen Cindy with her hashtag startup stress, you'll have been able to document some of the experiences that many of us go through. Um, and I've found for myself to get through it, um, you really have to take that mental strength and that physical strength and take time to build that in order to be able to get through it. So, you know, I do things like I meditate every day, I go running regularly, I keep time to do things that I absolutely love, that when I'm doing them, I can't think about business. So in my case, that's Arsenal um, or horse riding. I've got a, a very naughty horse who tries to chuck me off. So I have to kind of really focus when I'm with him. And it means that I do forget about business. Um, and I think if there's one thing that I'd known before I was an entrepreneur, it was how to build my emotional and physical strength so that I could keep centered and I could keep positive and I could have that courage to keep pushing through and I really wish I'd started that journey um, earlier. And then let's just talk about the end result. And I think it's always worth understanding what are you aiming to build a venture for or what are all of us aiming to build our venture for. So is it to be rich? Is it to change the world? Is it to secure a future for our family? Is it to fix something that's broken in our society or our economy? Or is it to make loads of money and then give it away to help others? Um, and through all my time meeting successful um, and happy entrepreneurs, I've never met a successful and happy one who said they wanted to become an entrepreneur to get rich. And then when I'm an angel investor now and I meet a team and I ask them why they want to build the business, if they say to get rich, I'm out. Not interested. I think the ones that really succeed are the ones who are really focused on doing it um, for a purpose. Um, and I think, I guess that makes sense because by the thing that's going to define all of us and when we're building something is, is, is the thing we're building. That's what will end up defining our life. And I think if you end up being rich but unfulfilled or rich or ashamed of the way you behaved on, the, on that journey, then all the struggle will be in vain. And I have met some of those people who have become extraordinarily wealthy but in a way that perhaps didn't give them fulfilment. And that may seem like a very enticing option right now, but trust me, having met those people, I wouldn't want it in the world. Um, it's not a happy place to be. So I think it's our responsibility as entrepreneurs to build a really great legacy, but more importantly, one that makes um, us happy. Um, and I think, I love Warren Buffett, he makes some hilarious quotes, but this one I think is, is really important. You know, it takes 20 years to build your business, but the way that you behave and... Uh, you know, you, you could lose that and your reputation in five minutes. So I, I can't emphasize this point enough. It's the reason for doing it, I think, has to, has to really work for you um, as a person. And I, that's also something that, that I've learned at times the hard way. So now to close, I want to talk a little bit um, about a fantastic woman. As it's Women's Day, I wanted to pay forward Cindy's kindness in recommending me to Oxford Inspires and pay it forward to a fantastic uh, woman entrepreneur, Amelia, who I've been lucky enough um, to meet this year, and she's, she's here with me, um, and she's amazing. And she's a two-time, a prime-time Emmy-nominated uh, producer and director. She's an Australian uh, of Sri Lankan, Dutch, Portuguese descent, so am amazing, glamorous mix. Um, and she's worked for leading content producers like Fremantle Media, Discovery, History Channel, and Oprah Winfrey. 
But this year, she took the plunge and took the plunge from a traditional career working for others and very glamorous lifestyle. And you'll see her here, gorgeous, with her red lipstick and beautiful outfits. Um, but this year, she took the plunge and she would say, in fact, she did on the train up to me, starting my own business has changed my life. So in 12 months, she's building a fantastic international business that really focuses on the, the view that marketing and media can be a force for good. Um, and the business is thriving. But a side benefit of getting to live her life fully, I think, is that um, it took her on a journey of meeting the man of her dreams. Um, and she's just about to swap the glamour to go and, and live with him. And he's, um, he's the head of peacekeeping for the UN mission. So she's swapping her glamorous life and she's going to be living in a container with the man of her dreams um, in South Sudan in quite, not very long now, a few weeks. Um, and she will tell you that the, the experience she's had from building her business in the last year has quite frankly changed her life in ways that she never thought were possible. Um, and I thought therefore it would be really nice to have somebody who is a brand new entrepreneur as, as well as me who's been a bit more long in the tooth at it. Um, so she's here with me now and, um, and she'll also answer questions um, as I will soon.